Good morning. My name is Daniel Nenny. I'm the founder of SemiWiki.com. For those of you who don't know, SemiWiki is an open forum for semiconductor professionals. We've been online for eight years. We have over three million visitors, so we uh, really have uh, a lot of exposure and a lot of analytics to help us understand the industry. Uh, I just want to ask you guys a quick question. This is actually my 35th DAC. I started in 1984. My first DAC was in Albuquerque. Uh, the 85 was in Las Vegas. I love Las Vegas DAC. Las Vegas DAC, anybody? Who loves Las Vegas DAC? <laughs> I hope it comes back. So what we're here today is to talk about cloud. Cloud is one of the more interesting topics in my opinion. In fact, over the last year, I mean, we've been talking about cloud for about 12 years or more. Over the last year, I think we've made more progress in the cloud than the last 12 years. I've talked to a lot of designers at the show who are in the cloud already. Talk to Google uh, designers who are doing chips for Google. It's an amazing thing. So what we want to do is talk to you about cloud. Uh, there is uh, representatives from vendors, but also customers that are using the cloud. We'd like to hear from you. There's a mic roaming around in the uh, audience. If you have questions, just ask. So first, I'll introduce the panel. Uh, first, we have Sanjay Adke. He's VP of Engineering at QST Solutions, a cloud user. Next, we have Todd James. He's a senior electronics engineer for the Air Force Research Laboratories. Uh, he actually is putting together the cloud for the Air Force. He is a former chip designer. Uh, we have Willie Chen. Willie Chen is TSMC Deputy Director of Design Methodology and Infrastructure. One of the things you should know is that the, inter the IT department of TSMC is now under Willie's group. So it is part of this whole cloud development. And we have Craig Johnson, VP of Cloud Business Development at Cadence. Craig and I have worked closely together for the last year or two on cloud. Um, so there really is a, a lot to say. First, I'd like to have uh, the panelists, Sanjay, start us off. Tell us what you do and tell us what your cloud experience is thus far. Perfect. Uh, can you hear me, guys? <clears throat> OK, great. Uh, so uh, QSD Solutions is a really new company. It started about. Started in August last year. I should move. Just speak up. Speak up. It uh, started in August last year, and uh, it was a startup that was uh, essentially uh, set up to provide men's-based solutions uh, for uh, different sensors, uh, sensors like uh, accelerometers, gyroscopes, magnetometer, and so on. And as uh, part of that. Uh, solution offering, we have a front end ASIC that's analog big signal that needed to be taped out in about six months. The uh, data tape out was like April this year and the company was started in August and really we had no time to set up any infrastructure at all but to tape out a chip. And that was one of the primary reasons why we chose to go to the cloud. Uh, and uh, long story short, we can talk more about it as the panel progresses. But the chip was taped out, and actually we just got the chip back this week from uh, uh, from our foundry, and it's uh, it seems like it's functional. So we managed to do this in six months with a brand new infrastructure in the cloud, and it was a great experience. So, yeah. so Todd, what so, what brings the Air Force to the cloud? So. I work at the Air Force, but this effort is actually sprawling now across the DOD. We just happen to be the POC for it. Um, some of the comments made by, uh, sorry, Sanjay, um, I would echo, which is that uh, it's difficult for us to stand up design environments quickly, to acquire hardware and capacity quickly. Um, acquisition cycles for us are probably even more painful than they are for commercial entities. So it takes a long time to get running on a chip project. Um, that's just one of the things we're trying to eliminate. Um, and for us, another really big driver is, um, in DOD, we have a lot of siloed environments. So I work at Air Force Research Laboratory. We have uh, the other researchers at Navy. We have researchers at Army. There, there are a lot of small groups of researchers everywhere. And for us to collaborate is very difficult. We have our own IT structures. It's quite difficult to log in from the outside into those structures, so collaboration is very difficult. 
the environment we're aiming for is an environment where we can stand up ad hoc design environments to serve a specific project or a specific purpose, invite the team members to that project, regardless of their geographical location, put all the tools, all the IP, everything that's needed at their disposal and go from there. That is a much faster process than the old way of doing it, which is, you know, we sort of collaborate via a Dropbox method, which is a miserable way to collaborate on a chip project. It's terrible. So those have been the primary drivers. Um, as we sort of interact with a lot more of our DOD partners, uh, we take in requests from them for sort of different capabilities. So we are broadening out beyond just that uh, type of environment. And the project environments are fairly generic. Um, in some cases, people are actually building tools to do research or tools for EDA. So some, in some cases, open source tools with commercial partners that are participating in, in research projects sponsored by the government. We also can host those items. So it really is broadening out, but the, the big sort of takeaway for us is it's a quick collaborative environment where we can get everything up and running quickly, um, have everybody together in one place even though they're scattered everywhere, um, and get the work done. Thank you. Uh, Willie, TSMC launched your OIP Cloud Alliance uh, in the fourth quarter of last year. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, what was your motivation? What's the TSMC Cloud strategy? Okay, great. Um, yeah, we started out our uh, Cloud Alliance uh, last October. Uh, the reason for that is actually driven by the market. Uh, at TSMC, we're seeing AI and 5G are driving tons of uh, different application into our uh, leading node TSMC technology. And uh, also at TSMC, we need to serve a, a big number of customers at the same time. So we realized that we could never have enough in-house compute uh, to depend on that uh, situation. So internally, we started to use uh, cloud for our production design uh, of those uh, uh, center cell library and memory and all uh, last year. And also, we figured that uh, once we start to use cloud, we get to deliver those things to customers in a more timely fashion. Then our end customer can also benefit uh, from using cloud to complete their designs faster. So the overall charter for the Cloud Alliance is uh, to kind of forge a new industry partnership and deliver uh, the end result uh, faster so the customer get to uh, tape out to TSMC faster and of uh, higher quality. So that's basically what we're doing. Uh, Craig, Cadence has been doing cloud for more than 10 years. I've tracked it. We've talked about this. Uh, Cadence uh, deserves a lot of credit for, for sticking to the cloud strategy and implementing it. Can you give me a, an update of your customer adoption experience and um, the, geo mar the geographic market segmentation? You know, who's using cloud? Sure. And I, I think there's probably no stronger indication of the importance of cloud than having Thomas Dolby open up for the cloud panel. Uh, he's did, did a good job of bringing some energy this morning. Uh, we appreciate uh, the fact that so many people are interested in cloud. And one of the unique things that Cadence has been able to do over the last uh, couple of years is call on a lot of customers and gain some firsthand uh, knowledge and experience about what, what the interest is. And what, what we're seeing is that the sentiment certainly shifted from security being a showstopper to uh, an acknowledgement that other high value IP was already in the cloud and it was time to consider a way to do design in the cloud. I would say that the, the trends tend to be that uh, companies who maybe are coming in new into the industry, as Willie mentioned, you know, AI is a big area where there's a lot of new, uh, new companies that are sprouting up. Those companies are seriously looking at starting on the cloud. So uh, there, it saves a lot of uh, hassle and a lot of early uh, distraction trying to set up flows and trying to set up an environment. So I'd say trend number one is that the, the smaller companies are looking to replace their entire infrastructure and use the cloud. The other uh, trend would seems to be that the, the larger, more established companies who have the big investments in data centers are uh, evaluating and trying to decide exactly how to, how to proceed. Do they want to do it? Uh, with a project at a time, or, or are they going to shift entire functions into the cloud to balance the use of their internal uh, resources versus external? Uh, so I, I think it's a little bit trickier of a decision for uh, a large company. And 
as so I think they're proceeding a little bit more more cautiously but but everyone we talk to has interest in the cloud I think it's a matter of, of when it's not really a matter of if they will will move in that direction so Craig just just a follow-up question um, you know I write about the cloud on semi wiki I see who reads it it jives with what you said a lot of emerging companies are really spending a lot of time researching the cloud also a lot of systems companies I don't see a lot of fabulous the big fabulous guys uh, researching it but the systems companies really have taken into the cloud and some of these system companies have their own cloud right Google's doing chips Amazon's doing chips Microsoft's doing chips they're, they're all cloud vendors how, how are the other companies going to compete with these guys that have access to unlimited resources for their design? I mean, I've talked to some of the Google guys who are doing the chips. They're doing simulations that take weeks overnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, advantage that a, a few of these uh, global cloud companies can actually have. They have the world's largest IT uh, budget and the largest IT uh, support system. But, you know, I think ultimately there's got to be a commercially viable way for <coughs> other companies to utilize the cloud. And the, and, and the cloud vendors aren't looking at their cloud uh, business as, an, as a captive internal differentiator. I think they can leverage it to that extent. But for whatever silicon that these companies are producing, it's just a drop in the bucket with regard to the silicon that's needed out there in the broader, the broader uh, electronics industry. Systems companies, by the way, sometimes are not as heavily invested in data centers as the IT companies, just because of the compute intensive nature of that. And you know, we're seeing an interesting uh, opportunity emerge. Uh, uh, Cadence uh, just recently announced a new a new product called Clarity, which is doing system level analysis. And our realization is that a lot of companies who are doing who need that that function and that capability don't have large data centers, that function and capability exploits the cloud. It, it's, it's highly parallelized and, and uh, having a cloud model that allows those companies to use that tool in a cloud environment in an easy way is a big enabler for that. So I think the, the problems are, are, and challenges are different, whether you're a system company, an IT company, or even a, a cloud vendor building silicon. Yeah, you know, if you haven't seen the recent announcements, um, AMD did an announcement about cloud about they taped out a chip and how the simulation, they actually gave numbers. It was one of the first big fabulous companies that I've seen that it, and the numbers were just incredible. So you might want to look that up. The other one is eSilicon announced uh, a couple weeks ago that they have put all their design in cloud. So they're getting rid of all their servers. Their, their, their facilities are gonna be computer free, they say. And when you're an ASIC company, you're really bound by margin, you're really bound by time. When you tell a customer you're gonna get a chip out at this cost at this time, you can't really go back and tell them. And uh, you know, the question I have is for the rest of these guys, if, if your competitor's using the cloud, you know, how, how are you gonna compete with that? But I guess the real question is, is about the tools in the cloud, right? They have to be ready. I think Willie, you would probably be the one to know. I mean, how are the tools in the cloud? I mean, it's a critical part of your OIP ecosystem, um, you know, are the tools ready? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we actually experienced quite a bit of that. Uh, when we first established the Cloud Alliance, um, well, naturally people think about those uh, major cloud service suppliers, uh, AWS, uh, Azure, Google, and all. But uh, we also focus on having the major EDA partners uh, in, in our Cloud Alliance. And the main purpose of it is to ensure that we have the cloud-ready uh, EDA solution. Um, so in our own, um, own usage, uh, first experience is that uh, when we try to do some of the interactive uh, layout uh, in the cloud, uh, what we use, because we're uh, location in Taiwan, right? So uh, the nearest uh, data center is probably the one in Singapore. If you look at the, the map, right, the, 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 the distance is like uh, 3,000 kilometers, and uh, no matter how you optimize the routing, um, the latency will be like in the range of 50, 60 milliseconds. Oh, that, that, that imposed certain you know, burden on the EDA tools. So initially, we, we did experience some of the glitches that uh, some of the tools, when you do the interactive mode, to do the graphic display, the performance wasn't really as good. But um, I, I think the, the really positive side is that uh, um, in the past uh, nine months, I feel that the EDA partners are really keen to work well with us and figure out that what the, the, how do we optimize, where do we optimize, and deliver 
the end result to the common customer. So I ended up, once you kind of update a graphic library in your tool, the, the problem goes away. So what I realized is that previously, since there's no, virtually no cloud usage paradigm, there's no need for any company to really optimize their tool in a way, you know, targeting cloud usage. But once uh, all of us start to use it, then there will be a, a legitimate reason. And uh, it's not that hard a problem. It's just uh, how do you find the right uh, target for it. So this is one of the experiments I want to share with you that overall I see that uh, the ED tool is there. It's uh, uh, okay for us to use, but once you use more, you're going to find additional issues. Then the ED partners are, are very interested in working with us to figure out uh, what's the priority, where do, where do we do the optimization. So I kind of see that that will be our kind of joint focus going forward in the next few years. But uh, clearly, uh, t today we're using cloud, our customer are using cloud, so ED readiness is definitely there. If we have questions, just raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. All right. Okay, so we say a lot of nice things about cloud, but the fact is everybody's not using cloud. We're still, you know, trying to get cloud experience and cloud, cloud ready. The two users here, I mean, uh, uh, Sanjay, can you tell me what the pitfalls of the cloud are? You know, did you, I mean, be honest now. There were problems. W what did you experience? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think overall the experience, I should preface this by the overall cloud experience for us has been actually really, really good. Uh, but there are always pitfalls with anything, right? And you gotta balance those. So one of the things about the cloud is that uh, everything has to, because it's a secure environment, everything has to go through cadence. And everything has to be, every issue has to be flagged as a ticket. So, you know, you can't just call up somebody or you can't just walk across the, uh, uh, your cube and uh, go to the IT guy and say, hey, this is not working, or this license went down, or this happened, you have to get online and put a ticket in, and then somebody from Cadence will respond and, and fix the problem. So there's a little bit of a turnaround time on the ticket. But what we found out really is that actually that's really useful because it's, it's something that is quantifiable. It takes a little bit of time, but it always gets resolved in that fixed amount of time. And if you follow the process, it really works well. So it took our team maybe a a couple of months to get used to that process, but now they're all for it. You know, they, they all, they know how to do tickets and they do it really well. And so that was a little bit of a teething, you know, learning curve that we had. Uh, the second issue I think that we had was trying to measure out exactly how much capacity you need in the cloud. You know, how many users and how does it scale? And that's something that's a trial and learning process where, you know, you want to scale your operation and you want to scale it in different countries you know, so we have groups right now in uh, Taiwan, we have group in Shanghai, and we have contractors in India, plus we have uh, guys at the Silicon Valley in San Jose. And we've been adding people in these, in these regions. And how do you get them online, and how many front-end logins do you have, uh, as opposed to how much compute server you turn on? You know, that's always a balancing act, because when you're trying to do a lot of verification, it's gonna take a lot of time. You know, how many licenses do you enable and how much compute capacity do you enable? And do you keep that on all the time or do you reduce it and scale it? Because it's a matter of cost. So getting that balance, I think, takes some amount of time. But once you've learned that and once you've gotten through a process, I think that's not really a big problem. That's really, if you look back, if you had a good IT department and a big scalable compute server in your office with VPN lines, you have pretty much the same problems, you know, when you have people coming in and when you want to add a compute server or not, you know, those, those are steps you have to take internally as well. But in this case here, you just make the decision and you tell cadence what you want to do and then they just add on the capacity in the cloud services that they have. Absolutely. So that makes, you know, it's, it really is a, it's a different way of looking at things. So we've gone through all of that and uh, we've actually had a reasonably good experience in everything. How about you, Todd? The government is filled with old dogs. Did, can you really teach them new tricks? You can, it takes time and patience. So first, let me echo some of what uh, Sanjay has said. I, I believe overall it has been a positive experience for us to move to the cloud. Having said that, it's not without its uh, pains. So particularly if you, you know, don't think of AFRL as a large enterprise. Think of the individual groups as really small enterprises. It's like a lot of small businesses. Um, if your IT department is not familiar with cloud structure and the way cloud works, 
that jump can be a bit painful because it's not the same thing as, oh, let's just stand up an NFS server and go for it. Um, cloud doesn't work the same way. The pricing models are different. Um, the storage models are different. So um, you can probably get that model to work, but you're probably not getting the most out of the cloud if that's the way you approach it, is to just try to replicate what you had in-house onto the cloud. So I would say make sure you have a, a, a decent cloud-aware team or cloud knowledgeable team when you make that leap that will help the transition quite a lot. Um, some of the other things that have been painful for us have not been uh, just specifically the cloud environment itself. So again, we're a lot of scattered organizations. Um, getting all of the different IT organizations and particularly the security organizations on board with what we're attempting to do has been uh, a lot of work for us. Um, in fact, it's been the long pull in the tent on a number of projects where we've had to get DOD to buy into, uh, yes, we have adequate security, yes, we have adequate controls. Um, so that has been a, a pretty large challenge for us, really. Um, we're still learning. Uh, another challenge for us has been sort of the way storage is done. So we have, we have a kind of a different long-term need than some companies in the sense that uh, we deploy platforms that you know, make cars almost look like consumer goods at this point, right? You're talking about 50 and 100 year platforms and there's a desire to save data and have data present and available over those very long time scales so that you can deal with uh, problems of obsolescence or going back and asking, well, why does this part behave this way? Um, before we just didn't have an answer to that. So that has been a challenge that we've had to overcome it's been work for us, but it's been good to take on that challenge to recognize that we had that problem and to now make an attempt to deal with it on a substrate that potentially has the ability to let us deal with it. It's a substrate where the data is together, the storage is very reliable over a very long haul, and we can start to, to tackle those sort of questions. So again, a very positive experience, but uh, not without its bumps along the way. Uh, I'll just add one thing. is. Um I'm a big proponent of cloud, and I actually moved my website to the cloud recently, just the last couple months, and one of the challenges I had was hiring somebody that had cloud experience. And it, you know, if you go out there and look at the web guys and say, who's got cloud experience? Nobody, yeah. really. So you know what I did was I hired a new college grad. Yeah. He did a great job. Uh, and uh, it was interesting, it brought me back to college because he worked all night. and. When he brought up the Google uh, or the, the control panel for the cloud, it was an amazing thing. So many controls, so many things we can do that I had never actually imagined. The one pitfall is you're going to pay for every resource you use, so be careful what you ask for. <laughs> so Craig, I want to ask you, um, you have a broad experience with customers. If you're going to advise a customer, a new customer that's coming into the cloud, what, what are the top three things? What are your three tips to these customers? Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward. The, the, the first one is spend enough time to clarify what your company's priorities are for using the cloud. Uh, that, that discussion and analysis and, and uh, research that you do and, and, and time spending doing that will save you a lot of time later. There's usually a lot of different expectations about what the cloud is going to do. and. Uh, if, if everyone's not aligned, that takes a long time. So that's number one. Uh, you know, two, figure out what your use model is. Understand how you're going to use it. Is it a full project? Is it a function? Is it uh, you know, uh, for collaboration? Make sure that, that that's clear so that when you architect it, it, it solves that problem. And then you know, probably the third thing is it takes a lot of collaboration across the, uh, not just within your company, but with a, a foundry, with a, a tool provider, you know, with uh, the third-party IT providers, and, and even in, you know, an interesting thing about AFRL and what, what Todd mentioned is that they didn't have all of that cloud expertise internally, and they leveraged a, a partner, Nimbus, who, is, as Dan mentioned, is now part of this Passport Partner Program. So the, these partners can accelerate and, and help you figure out some of those things as well. So Willie, uh, we've talked about the tools and stuff, what about the cloud providers? TSMC works with multiple cloud providers. Yes, we do. 
I mean, chip design in the cloud is, is a lot different from shopping in the cloud and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. searching in the cloud. Right, right. So are, are the cloud services really ready for us? Yeah, that's a very, very good uh, point. Uh, our, our experience, uh, I'd say it's a very rewarding learning experience that we had with all the cloud uh, service providers. So today we see uh, uh, all the different cloud service providers bring out a new VM type that's targeting the EA workload. But uh, we're not just only talking about uh, how fast is the CPU. It really also includes how big the memory for, for the server and also how fast, how efficient uh, is the storage I.O. and all, right? So it's a whole package we're looking at. So, so in our own experience, uh, we, it's not a secret. We actually announced it that we were doing uh, five nanometer S3 development in the cloud. Ah. So, so that put a lot of burden, you know, initially on, on, on our cloud partner and also our EDA partner as well. So, so I'll say that it's, it's very important for, for end user to understand your need. Then you find the right partner to work with. And uh, I see that throughout this uh, new initiative of the Cloud Alliance, we do have uh, this kind of industry-wide initiative that all ecosystems understand that we need each other. And we need to better you know, collaborate with each other by starting from understanding each other's need and where we can add value. So I'll say that uh, I totally agree with you then that uh, if you're you know, doing the video streaming um, in, in, in the cloud, right, that's a big business over there. That's one time ride and a lot of people reading because they're watching movies. But when, when we're running the EDA tools, it's really a heavy duty, you know, read all the library at the same time. Say that you're doing you know, 100 timing sign off, you know, all the different corners all at once. That imposes quite a bit of burden on your, your disk I.O. and all. Right? But then uh, you start to realize there are timing violations here and there, then you need to write those uh, violations into the report. That also imposes a lot of a burden on the writing part. So those are the things that I, I see that going forward. Right now that uh, the cloud infrastructure is more suitable for uh, kind of commercial-based, transaction-based, commercial-grade solution. Because that's where the business is for cloud today. But going forward, I see that you know, as a, you know, as a whole, that the, we semiconductor industry been pretty successfully grabbing the attention from the cloud guys, right? So they're all there, they're exhibiting at that for the first time, right? So, so those, those are good signs that uh, we start to understand each other, we start to, you know, work with each other to figure out that how do we put together an industrial grade of a solution of the infrastructure in the cloud so uh, all our IT designers can benefit from it. Quick question. So uh, we've talked about how being on cloud can be expensive. You were mentioning how you pay for everything. Something we at AMD found is it's very easy to spend money really fast without <laughs> noticing it. Yeah. I'm wondering what have the panel members done in terms of internal controls to make sure you didn't accidentally spin up a whole bunch of stuff that's sort of sitting there uh, consuming money and you don't realize it. Craig, do you have thoughts on that? You've seen, you've seen it. Yeah, we've we've experienced some of that internally. Uh, Cadence uses the cloud for some of our uh, development work, and just in talking with with my colleagues in the IT department, they underestimated the the need to be tracking very carefully uh, who was using which service and when, because one, once the bill arrives. It's very easy for an engineer to forget whether that they launched a, a thousand jobs. Uh, and <laughs> so uh, I'd say be, be careful about that. But it, more, more or less, uh, there are business benefits that come sometimes from spending that money. So if, if you look at it purely as a, as a cost-driven activity, you'll probably come to the conclusion that the most cost-efficient thing is to own your own server and utilize it 100% of the time. So uh, it, 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 there, there is a, a balance between the, the cost and the, and the benefit, and it's not always the same trade-off that, that was historically visible to the, uh, to the IT user. So you know, I, I, I talked to, just one other, to add one other note is, I talked to the eSilicon CEO when, when they announced this, because in the ASIC business, cost is everything. And I said, hey, Jack, how are you gonna control your cost with your engineers are gonna, you know, use huge amounts of resources and they said that uh, they have a tool a kind of machine learning language tool that looks at their previous designs 
and they can actually estimate what it's going to take to do the next design, and they put that in their costing model. So it was already part of their business, but now they have to apply it to the cloud, so it can say, hey, this is how much resources you can have, you know, for, for this time and delivery and such. So it was quite, kind of an interesting uh, predicament, especially for ASIC guys, because they do this for cost. Another oh, question? If, sorry. Uh, thank you for this uh, interesting discussion. Y you mentioned earlier about the need for teams internally to be able to work in the cloud, have the skills and the competence and, and capability in the cloud. The company I work for helps semiconductor companies move into the cloud and very early on there wasn't um, the, it, it was a very much a sense of we just want you to do the work and there was some challenges in terms of people adopting and building up the practices internally is is that desire changing is the is the hunger and the desire for working in the cloud and knowledge in the cloud and getting built up via knowledge transfer is that is that changing or are semiconductor companies going to need to hire in external cloud people to help build up that practice. Craig? Yeah, uh, I, I think it depends on the company's ultimate long-term objective. You know, I, I think Sanjay points out that you know they're, they're a smaller company. They made a conscious choice not to go down the path of investing in cloud expertise or IT expertise, so that, that, that's one path. Uh, the, a, a larger company may ultimately want to develop all of that, that capability and skill set, so they may have some sort of hybrid uh, strategy where they'll utilize a, a service or a, or a cadence managed offering for a while and then to build up that, that capacity and capability. Uh, there is a, a skill set gap, but I, I think any talented IT person can learn and, and develop new skills to support the cloud. So it, it, it's not, it's different, it's, it's just not the, the same. So I think there's a role for, for both of those types of uh, customers. Okay, question here. Yeah, this is uh, for TSMC. Uh, what are the security criteria that you apply in order for your IT, like PDKs and things like this, to be reside on the cloud? I'm sure that you have given some consideration on this. And uh, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an excellent question. You know, yeah. security is everything. In fact, I'd like to, who in this audience is concerned about cloud security? I mean, we all have stuff in the cloud, right? This is, I think this has been one of the, the, the holding back factors of the cloud. Willie, TSMC, as he said, you guys live and die by security. I've been through your security protocols. <laughs> <laughs> so you know us very well, Dan. Yeah, so security is totally a, a key concern. It's the foundation of everything. So at TSMC, we actually started out our activity regarding cloud probably more than two years ago. And for the first uh, two years, we actually totally focused on the security itself. Initially, uh, we, we say no. When customer asked that, hey, can we just put the, your stuff, your PDK, your technology uh, design collateral in the cloud? We're like, we're not sure. Probably we don't want you to do that. So it's been like that uh, uh, since the very beginning. So we, you can say that we actually spent two years um, from our corporate ID organization work in that um, collaboration with the cloud partners for a very, very long time, go through all the individual details and all visiting their data center and all. So that's one of the first aspects of it that uh, we finally decided uh, last year that uh, uh, the cloud service providers, they, they have the right investment, they have the right level of capacity, and they have the right you know, people to handle that uh, uh, security for us. As you understand, today we're talking about seven nanometer, five nanometer. Well, not too many people have that in this industry. I'm talking about process itself, right? So, so that's very, very critical for TSMC. So we take security very seriously. And uh, as of today, we conclude that uh, uh, we have this um, cloud se security certification program. We have a number of uh, partners in this particular category, the ones that in our cloud alliance. So those are the ones that we feel that uh, they meet our uh, security standard for that. And we start to authorize our end customer using that. So if you're a, a TSMC customer and you choose uh, one of those uh, TSMC certified uh, cloud service provider, all you need to do is just uh, uh, 
kind of do a, a quick amendment on the NDA with us, and then you're ready to do it. On the other hand, that uh, we also you know work very closely with our media partners, also IP partners as well. So for th in that regard, uh, that's the key essence of OIP, right? So we help each other in the e ecosystem sense. So what we do additionally with the partners we work directly with is that we actually you know provide a, a list of guidelines, help them to understand that what are the needed uh, uh, security measures that cloud service provider already offered, but you need to invoke it in the right way. So they implemented and we actually send in our IT teams to audit their implementation. So, so kind of, you know, long story short that uh, when TSMC talk, talk about cloud security, there are two different aspects. One is we make sure the cloud service provider meet TSMC security standard. And we have a number of those uh, uh, sub, uh, cloud service providers certified for that. Then we work with the, uh, actually the end user sense of the ecosystem, that the EDA IP partners. We work with them, we actually do the audit, make sure that they invoke those uh, security measures in the right way. So Cadence is one of the first uh, partner we work with, we actually go through very rigorous mm -hmm. process for more than six months for that. Yeah. And once uh, we get that done, that's our idea of kind of, you know, you, you work slowly in order to move very fast later on. So we tied all those loose ends, and now we are very confident having our process uh, data up there, and that's also why at TSMC we're actually doing uh, our five nanometer uh, foundation IP development in the cloud. So final thoughts, Sanjay. Yeah, I have a slightly different, being a startup company, I have a slightly different concept of security. The reason is the following. I've actually worked in my past life a lot on an AWS cloud, uh, storing some highly secure stuff there. As a startup company doing innovative design and innovative IT, you're really paranoid about your security and you want to secure everything you have. But the reality is that as a startup company, you cannot afford the best IT and the best security personnel that are available. And therefore, if you were to set up your own design met uh, methodology in-house, your design servers in-house, I can guarantee you the security of that is actually going to be fairly poor because it's, it's easily hackable from outside. That's the case. Contrasting that with having your IT being developed and stored in the cloud, maybe under an AWS cloud like Kazos maybe does, and knowing security protocols that AWS follows, I think that IT for a start, from a startup perspective is far more secure in the cloud than it is in my own premises. And that's the paradigm we followed in QST. And so we have no concerns about security at this point in time. That does not mean it won't change as it becomes a big multi-billion dollar company. You know, it can change. But right now, to us, security is the least important thing. Actually, we feel more secure being in the cloud. How about you, Todd? Security's gotta be an issue. <laughs> yes, it's always a big issue for us, but I, I can echo some of those same comments. Uh, we, hit, we have to sell that upwards but I have to feel that given that, you know, so AWS is our primary partner right now, even though we're cloud agnostic, they're very upfront about the security controls they implement. These are not hidden, they're published in voluminous volumes that you can read. So everyone knows what they're getting with security. They know what controls are available. You know, contrast this, imagine a, a DOD project that is scattered across a number of primes, a number of subcontractors, resource organizations, so how many different IT systems is the data for that stuff sitting on? Now, look at the opposite side of that. If we can bring that stuff all to one system where all of us can audit the controls and see the controls, we can actually try to apply a best practice across an entire project, not just hope that all of the suppliers have actually followed through on that. So I think that's actually a strong selling point for this. It is a selling point. We have to still sell this upwards because DOD obviously is you know, has always been very much about isolation. Let's keep it on in-house in computers as if on-the-premise computers are somehow more safe even though they're still on the internet. I question that. Um, and particularly as we, as we farm that stuff out to, again, primes and, and subcontractors, research organizations we work with, which may be universities. They may have research on their university computers. You know, how tight is that IT really? We've all been to university. We know what that looks like. So. I'm coming from a place where I feel like if, if the controls are known, they're published, 
we can all audit those controls and see what those controls look like. We have a much better handle on that security profile now than we ever did before. That's my feeling for it. Okay, I think we're about out of time. Do you have any final thoughts, Craig? Uh, no, I think uh, it's great to see our, our industry move in this direction. It's a journey. It's not, you know, it's not a, a, a simple thing for a company to embrace a new uh, compute infrastructure. There's lots of solutions out there to help you uh, take advantage of the cloud in whatever manner makes sense. And, and you know, Cadence is lucky to be a part of it, and we have uh, great customers and great partners who are, who are helping make that happen. So, you know, thank you. Well, I, I want to congratulate Cadence on their efforts in the cloud and, and TSMC and the panelists. I think the, the, the progress we've made in the past year is much greater than the past 10 years combined. And I think next year at this panel, you will see even larger progress in the cloud. Thank you for coming. Thank you, panel.